No, thank you for the uh, invitation to uh, speak to your group tonight. And hopefully we can have a nice discussion uh, afterwards. Um, so uh, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, um, I'm Gary Bentrop. I'm a research landscape planner at the USDA National Agroforestry Center, which is based in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, we're a national center, um, but a fairly small staff. We also have an office in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, <clears throat> regarding the kind of presentation, um, I kind of want to set a stage for how climate change and other things are impacting agriculture and food systems. I think it's good to know where we're coming from, to know where we need to go. And then what are some options for growing climate smart solutions? And then at the end, um, how is this information actionable? Um, particularly, you know, for an urban audience. Uh, although I was really intrigued to hear some of uh, your group's plans on where you plan to go with things. So a little background on myself. Uh, I grew up on a farm in uh, Southwest Kansas that my grandfather started. And a uh, little, that I know I was destined to end up in agroforestry. I played a lot in our farms, a shelter belt around the, the farmstead. And I went on to pursue degrees in landscape architecture and landscape planning. Um, this was particularly drew me because I was really interested in dealing with a lot of different topics. I wasn't, I didn't wanna focus in say just on wildlife or, or just, figure in on just soils or things of that nature. The broad-based stuff was always appealing to me. And so that kind of led me to a career um, in uh, regenerative ag and, and agroforestry. So I want to set a little bit of a stage uh, regarding the current status of agriculture, um, both from kind of a social economic to an ecological. Um, framework. So that gives us kind of a starting point for when we think about how do we build uh, climate solutions. And I, one is I, I think it's very interesting to look at the change in uh, disposable income spent on food over time. Um, since the 1960s, it's dropped from about 18% to below 10%. That's a pretty significant drop. And if we take a longer term look, going back to around the, the turn of the century uh, or around the, it has dropped from 24%. So not saying that's good or bad, it's, it's a fact that we're spending a lot less on food. We've got cheap food ultimately. Well, how does this, some of this relate into agricultural economics? Um, the one chart on the left shows um, how much it costs um, to plant, um, uh, per acre and the net return. So this is the annual net returns per acre. And can see that in many years, and especially recent years, it's actually been below production costs. Um, farmers can still sometimes make a living on this uh, with government payments and other kind of uh, subsidies. But this is just to kind of say farming is, is a challenging uh, enterprise uh, for some operators. And this has led to in the next chart, seeing where um, a lot of farms have a bit of off farm income. Uh, the small farmers, almost the majority of their income is coming off of uh, off the farm. And then when you get to farms that have sales well over a quarter million, then that percent of farm income is higher than the off farm income. Another kind of interesting tidbit that people don't always realize is how much of agricultural land is rented by uh, farmers these days. So as a nationwide statistic, uh, over 54% of cropland is rented um, and these uh, people can be renting it from producers from uh, who have left the farm a couple generations back. Uh, in fact, my sisters and I still have the farm in Kansas, and we rent to local producers in the area. 
the chart on the right kind of shows the concentration of where this rented land is. And you can see Illinois is one of the prime spots where well over 60% of the agricultural land is rented. And this kind of has some impacts in terms of how land is stewarded sometimes, or what can be done on land when you're looking for long-term solutions um, to deal with land, but yet you don't own the land. And so that requires a conversation with the uh, tenant and landowner. So what about now climate change and some of its impacts on agriculture? Here's a, a chart showing the uh, change in yields uh, predicted for 2080 to 2099. Um, again, this is just looking at some of the main commodities, not looking at some of our other um, changes in, in yields from say fruits and vegetables, but it does show that uh, areas are going to be kind of uh, impacted where there's going to be a bit of drop in yields in some areas, and other areas might have some gains, um, and that has impacts. I put this chart up, not all the detail, but just maybe focusing on the Midwest. There's a, going to be a lot of different changes uh, with climate change on various uh, climatic factors that influence agriculture. Everything from annual precipitation to the timing of precipitation, the length of growing season, the number of hot days and hot spells. So for here in the Midwest, we're expected to see a bit more increase in precipitation coming in the spring and winter months with maybe a decrease in, in the summer months. Growing season is expected to increase, but along with that is sometimes uh, some of the frost days will still be coming. And so it's just really dynamic landscape in terms of climate change and its effect on agriculture. Um, and so in addition to kind of the overall average and trends or average changes and like average precipitation, we really have more extreme weather events where we're getting either droughts, significant droughts like the 2012 drought that hit most of the country, particularly the Midwest, or also these extreme precipitation events. And we can kind of see that this is having impact in terms of, of cost. Um, we're seeing much more higher uh, environmental disasters um, that cost significant amounts of money. And when we look at crop insurance, we can see we're really paying out a lot more in indemnities over the years than we have in the past. Um, and so that's a long-term trend as well. We're paying for it through these mechanisms. Another aspect is lack of vegetation cover. When we grow our crops in the, the Midwest, there's a significant portion of the year where there is no cover on the ground. Um, and this is getting to be more and more problematic, again, as I alluded to, with the change in seasonal precipitation. Uh, particularly in the upper Midwest, we're seeing precipitation increase over winter and spring months when there is no cover on the ground and is more prone to erosion. And then we're seeing the summer months when we really want the rain um, to be a decrease. Another aspect of our current agricultural system is low landscape diversity. We really have kind of uh, created an industrial scale system of agriculture uh, that has offered some benefits, maybe in mechanization, uh, but that has came at a cost. So large fields like this are very prone to disease and pest outbreaks uh, if you get uh, any other uh, environmental effect uh, that can take out that crop, that can be a very significant loss. But this loss of landscape diversity also has impacts on other ecosystem services and other things that we desire. I have this uh, illustration here showing uh, where wild bees are now at risk uh, due to habitat loss primarily. We can again see up through the uh, Mississippi region, up through in Illinois, that this is kind of an area where we really have lost some of this biodiversity. 
been fed. And then what? he's been fed. And then thinking about um, these on uh, kind of even a larger regional impact, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Gulf hypoxia zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a dead zone with low oxygen where basically no aquatic life exists. And so shrimpers and other fishermen have to go out beyond this dead zone to find uh, uh, basically ocean habitat where species can live. And this is a result of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus coming down the Mississippi River Basin uh, going into the, the Gulf and creating an entrophic zone or this hypoxia. And we can see from the bottom bar chart, our goal of around 2000 square miles, which is still a significant area, we're really not have been hitting that over the long term. Um, and we can see from the other chart where the states are that are kind of the major contributors uh, to this. And of course, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana are some of the primary states through our agriculture systems contributing to this pulse of fertilizer into the Gulf. And to kind of just wrap this section up, um, bringing it down to some maybe some economics, um, and I apologize, I don't have Illinois here, but the Iowa has a nutrient reduction strategy goal to try to reduce uh, nitrogen and phosphorus loading into the Gulf. And their goal is 45% reduction. And it's estimated that to get this goal, they need to spend about one and a half to almost three billion per year over 50 years to meet this goal. So a significant amount of money to achieve um, a reduction in some of these external problems that uh, our current agriculture system has, uh, has created. Um, and again, just the, the phosphorus and nitrogen chart there is just showing where for a phosphorus, a lot of it's coming from pasture and range through manure, uh, where from the nitrogen, a lot of it's coming from our corn and soybeans. Um, and to tie it back to, to climate change a little bit, fertilization has a, actually a large uh, greenhouse gas footprint in terms of nitrous oxide. All right. So with that stage, kind of thinking about looking forward, growing our climate smart solutions. And I'm kind of just throwing out some criteria to think about um, what, are, what do we want from a system that is more climate resilient, but also achieves some of those or starts to solve some of those other problems I alluded to with the first slides, kind of setting the stage some of the economic issues, um, maybe also hitting upon uh, some of the social equity issues. So not that this list is complete by any means, but one, I think we need landscapes and agricultural systems that are very multifunctional. If we optimize for one function, whether it be crop production or even carbon sequestration, it's usually at the detriment of other ecosystem services that we want from the landscape. We also know that we need to really create kind of a socially equitable system. If we make food get too expensive, it will cost out and be a not affordable for some groups uh, or at least highly nutritious food. Um, but we also know we need an economically viable system. Uh, again, an agriculture system that's based on most people working off farm to make ends meet, maybe isn't really a, a viable system. Uh, this idea that they need to be diversified systems uh, to be more resilient to climate shocks, market shocks, um, and reduce some of those uh, loss of ecosystem services like pest control and, and wildlife habitat loss. And then criteria such as minimal, low, or no externalities, things that we're not creating downstream problems for others to pay or deal with. So now moving on into kind of the regenerative agriculture toolbox. And regenerative agriculture is kind of just a big umbrella. It describes farming and grazing practices uh, that can reduce kind of climate change by rebuilding soil organic matter, restoring soil health, 
but also it's broader than that. It can also uh, increase habitat uh, and provide a, uh, a multitude of other kind of benefits. So just going to run through what are kind of common principles or approaches under this regenerative agriculture toolbox. One is really trying to minimize that soil disturbance, trying to do either no-till, low-till, trying to minimize some of the uh, chemical inputs that can kill the biological community within a soil, which is really help, helpful for um, good production. Um, building in diversity, and this diversity is in cropping systems, doing more rotations with perennial crops, uh, with different species, doing uh, species that also may be nitrogen fixing uh, that can reduce uh, fertilizer inputs. We also want to move it toward a system that has less bare ground, keeping the soil more armored, having more roots living during the course of the overall growing season. Um, one person described it to me, why would we have, if you had a factory that says, we're gonna close down after three months of, or say five months of production and just let the factory sit idle, you would be going, it's ludicrous. But essentially that's kind of what we're doing right now in our annual cropping systems. We're really only relying on that resource for a couple months out of the year. We really need a more holistic uh, approach to thinking about. Also, integrating animals is a fairly important principle within regenerative ag. This drives nutrient, nutrient cycling. We can bring back fertilizer inputs into these systems by integrating livestock appropriately. It also provides opportunity to create wildlife habitat. Uh, hedgerows and, and perennial crop strips that can provide pollinator habitat or other wildlife habitat. And then these solutions, because um, they increase say soil organic matter in the soil, which can absorb and hold more water capacity, there can be less uh, flooding. You also have a better water holding capacity that reduces the impacts of drought. So, <clears throat> Within this kind of toolbox, there's a whole suite of different strategies and approaches. This slide kind of just illustrates uh, several of them. And they can be very uh, principles from things we know from a long time ago in agriculture. Again, the integration of livestock, as well as very high technological approaches, such as precision agriculture or robotics. Uh, can also be a tool to help achieve regenerative agriculture. It's not a ludite uh, approach to agriculture. Um, just to pick out a couple uh, on this list, again, no-till, you might have heard a bit about. The idea here is to leave a lot of the crop stubble on the ground. This minimizes uh, water erosion. It allows uh, capture of snow, soil, leaks, excuse me, snow. Um, it again allows a better biological community in the soil, allows more infiltration, as well as helps uh, store more soil carbon. Um, there's perennial crop development. You may have heard of a, a, a product called Kernza. It's a perennial wheatgrass that has been bred. It functions much like wheat, but rather than being an annual crop, it will grow for at least three or more years. So you don't have to do, you don't have to replant it. You don't have to till the soil for it. Uh, you can harvest it and use it much like some other uh, wheat-based products. That's still kind of under development, but there's um, efforts to develop other perennial crops. Um, biochar. Uh, there are a lot of interest in that, and that's basically taking plant waste, uh, both herbaceous or woody, and basically under pyrolysis, making a charcoal and putting that on the land as a soil amendment. Uh, and here it holds, uh, a, it can improve uh, crop productivity, holding uh, nutrients better. Um, and also it has the benefit of storing carbon uh, over a really long time period. 
There are challenges with it in terms of economics and the full life cycle cost of the energy to create the biochar. Um, and let's see, maybe pick out one more. Uh, cover crops is also another one you'll hear a lot about. This can put cover on the landscape when there isn't. And again, this really is important to minimize that erosion, help build up soil carbon in the landscape, can also provide pollinator habitat. Um, but now I kind of want to shift toward my area, and that's agroforestry. Um, and so agroforestry is the intentional integration of trees and shrubs into crop and animal farming systems to create environmental, economic, and social benefits. Um, agroforestry has a long history coming out of the tropical regions. I assume many people on this call enjoy coffee or chocolate. Uh, and these are often grown in the tropical environments in agroforestry systems. Uh, Shade-grown coffee, as this picture down in the lower left shows, um, is, and it's also really important, again, in a climate change scenario, because uh, these areas are warming up and becoming less suitable for growing uh, coffee, which is very sad to hear, as I thrive on coffee. Um, but agroforestry environments, because of the shade-grown aspect, are able to maintain some of the coffee productivity in areas that are experiencing this climate change. Within the US, uh, we have a different uh, a variety of categories of agroforestry. Um, not going to dive deep into any of these because uh, I'm keeping it fairly high level. Um, we can talk more about these in, 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 um, later if we want. But they're, they're basically the integration of trees into these crop and livestock systems uh, to provide these various benefits. And so like windbreaks within the Midwest is one that we're probably familiar with. At the edge of a field, this is to reduce uh, wind erosion, soil erosion, but also it helps the microclimate next to a crop. And so you'll get an overall yield bump um, for the crop next to a windbreak out for about 10 heights, the tree height. Um, there is a drop right next to the trees for uh, where the, there's competition for water and, and uh, nutrients, but then there is an actual increase in the crop uh, farther out. And this has an overall higher net yield with windbreaks. Um, Silvo pasture is another one. And, and this is where you're integrating trees into pasture lands. This is really important under climate change where uh, this can provide shade for livestock well-being. Um, and uh, it also allows uh, for uh, the production of other economic uh, goods. So you have both the livestock as well as uh, the woody component can provide a long-term income source either through timber production or possibly it's nut producing. In the south, there's also pine straw that's harvested from these systems used as a landscape mulch. Um, within the US, uh, agroforestry, we have a, a, uh, a census which uh, asked farmers if they have at least one agroforestry practice on their farm. In this last census, over 30,000 farms have at least one agroforestry practice. That still is not a significant amount, given that there's about 2 million farms in the United States. The darker blue areas show areas where agroforestry is practiced more. Oregon and Pennsylvania are some of the top uh, states, but also Texas and Missouri. I have an example here of Illinois, and this is farmers, uh, the number of farms with agroforestry practices across uh, the state. And due to the nature of this question in um, the survey, unfortunately, I can't detail out um, which agroforestry practices these farmers are using. I would guess the majority are riparian forest buffers and also windbreaks. Uh, but I do know in Illinois, there are producers doing uh, some civil pasture systems as well as doing uh, some alley cropping systems. Um, 
here's just kind of a, a, a nationwide photo gallery of some of the agroforestry practices across the United States. Um, so for instance, we've got sugar mapling up in New England. That's an agroforestry practice that falls under the category of forest farming. Below, we've got uh, mushroom logs. Uh, when people thin their woodlands, uh, particularly of oak trees, these are great trees for uh, growing um, marketable mushrooms and producers have been doing that. Uh, we've got an alley cropping system up here with cotton and pine trees. Uh, again, the pine trees offering uh, a long-term product as well as providing some microclimate benefits to the cotton crop in between. Below we have a, a livestock windbreak providing protection for uh, cows. We've got a windbreak in the Pacific Islands that's uh, protecting uh, the crops there because they get some pretty strong uh, coastal winds. And then the last one up at the top is a, a, a civil pasture system with poultry. This is actually in an urban environment in the Twin Cities area. And they actually have, uh, they market out under, I believe the name is called tree range uh, chickens that are available in markets. It's a really good system for producing poultry because poultry are jungle fowl. They thrive much better in a kind of a wooded environment and they harvest things like uh, elderberries and other things that are grown in this overstory. Um, I kind of now want to just talk about one historical example of agroforestry in the United States. Um, during the 1930s, as many of you know, the Dust Bowl really racked havoc across uh, the United States. Um, it caused one of the largest, uh, well, it caused the largest a migration uh, of uh, citizens in the US. Over 3 million left the region during this period. Uh, and and was it really rendered a lot of this cropland uh, difficult to use. Uh, Forest Service, along with the Conservation Corps programs through the New Deal, uh, planted over 18,000 miles of windbreaks across 30,000 farms in a region from North Dakota down to the upper part of uh, Texas. And many of these windbreaks are still in place these day, to this day and still provide uh, ecosystem services over this multi-generational period. And this is still particularly important as we move into climate change again, um, as we're expected to have more drying events and there's predictions to see uh, wind erosion actually increase. Uh, just two years ago, we had a significant dust bowl event, a single day event here in Lincoln, Nebraska, just west of town that resulted in a 29 car pileup and a couple fatalities. And there was one in Illinois about two years ago as well. So although the Dust Bowl events are rare these days, they still occur, occur and windbreaks are kind of part of the, the way to reduce this. Um, kind of now just stepping back and talking about how these do affect in a climate change uh, way. Risk management is incredibly difficult in a monoculture system. Um, you can see here where we've got a corn crop that's flooded and likely is not gonna be able to produce a viable yield at the end of the year, where below we have an alley cropping system. It's with willows and a forage crop grown in between, that would be hay. The hay crop uh, was lost but the willow crop, which is going to be used for a biomass uh, production, uh, is still just fine and will provide an economic yield for that farmer uh, this year when otherwise a flood would have taken out a monocrop culture um, crop. And the little kind of spider chart on the far right kind of shows how we are trying to find a sweet spot of optimizing various ecosystem services rather than maximizing for one. You know, with uh, regenerative agriculture and with uh, agroforestry, we might reduce crop production to some degree, but we also get a variety of other ecosystem services that offset 
that reduction. So we're getting a much more balanced system that will be both uh, more resilient and economically viable. And now to kind of move into just talk a little bit about it in terms of, you know, our goal to uh, reduce our, our carbon footprint. There's a lot of interest in looking at the agriculture sector as a way to be a carbon sink um, and to reduce the impacts from other industries. Uh, as well as it uh, reduces agriculture's footprint itself. Agriculture's contribution to uh, our US global greenhouse gas by sector is around 9, 10% uh, compared to other sectors such as commercial, uh, residential, and industry. Um, and agroforestry, as well as some of the regenerative agriculture practices, tie up carbon in various pools. Uh, with agroforestry, you're tying up carbon both in the woody biomass as well as in the soil carbon. Uh, there's also some benefits in terms of reduction in emissions. And what I mean by that is uh, you don't fertilize the woody component. You don't also have tractors or equipment going over that woody component. And so those are both reductions in um, uh, greenhouse gases from both the fossil fuel savings as well as less uh, nitrous oxide from uh, fertilization. Um, and the little table on the far uh, right kind of shows just some of the magnitude of some of the carbon sequestration um, benefits when we kind of move from say something that's maybe a conservation tillage up to where we're adding kind of trees back in the landscape. Um, and that each of these is not um, a silver bullet. Uh, I think it's important to recognize when we're looking for climate solutions, there's not uh, one, one that is going to be the end all. And particularly with um, nature-based solutions or trying to do um, uh, sequester carbon in agricultural systems, we have to think about permanence. Uh, for instance, if we store a lot of carbon in soil, um, which is great not only from a climate change point of view, but from all those other benefits I mentioned earlier, it's important to note that it may not stay put if we suddenly, for some reason, start to till it. Um, so we could lose that carbon very easily. With the tree component, there could be fires, or there could be just taking that uh, that tree crop out of for whatever reason, and that would be a loss. Um, I think it's always important to think about these as transitional steps as we work toward a more decarbonization of our our fossil fuel systems as a whole, um, where I think probably we get the most bang in terms of agriculture is anything that does a reduction in emissions, uh, because that is truly off the books once and for all. Um, what I mentioned like reduction in or a fuel use or fertilizer inputs where the carbon can always kind of be lost over time. It's still a good uh, solution, but just recognizing it's a uh, lack of permanence. Um, and now I just want to kind of throw in like, okay, recognizing an urban environment uh, coming from in Chicago. And, you know, what about agroforestry or regenerative agriculture within an urban environment? And, you know, there's a lot of interest in doing uh, urban agriculture. It's really growing. Uh, and, and it's more than just boutique. There's uh, really actually significant um, gains uh, with reducing uh, the food miles that when food is not having to come in from the coast, uh, that's a really significant reduction in energy. Um, there's also uh, opportunities to build community around uh, urban agriculture. Within the uh, agroforestry piece, there is what's called urban food forest. Uh, this is a really growing uh, trend across the country where these are both done in commercial uh, settings done in parks, public land, where 
uh, the planting of basically nut and fruit producing trees. Uh, here's one of the oldest ones known, uh, established in Asheville, North Carolina in 1997. Um, and one of the kind of benefits of producing food, uh, particularly nut and fruit products in an urban environment is that these um, um, seem to be less susceptible to some of the urban uh, pollution. Uh, studies have shown that there's less or almost no heavy metals found in fruit and nuts, where sometimes with the uh, vegetable crops, depending on where they're grown, on what soils are grown, where they are in the urban environment, that has to be taken into consideration. And so there's opportunities for providing healthy food um, uh, using kind of agroforestry principles in an urban environment. I looked in the Chicago area and Again, there's a lot of food forest around the country. There's a really big, couple big ones in Atlanta, Georgia. I wasn't finding so many in the Chicago area, but I did find this one, Edible Evanston. Uh, looks like they have a food forest and actually some volunteering efforts, just uh, as a uh, interesting side note. Um, and so now kind of wrapping it up uh, a little bit like where I said, it's like, okay, I recognize I'm talking to uh, an urban audience, and uh, you know, so what? You know, how how is this information maybe actionable? Um, and I think most of these you would recognize. You know, food decisions do matter. How we buy food, where we buy food, how it's grown, um, that can can make a difference. Uh, there's also these urban opportunities for agriculture that I mentioned. You know, and I think too, in, in, in from an urban viewpoint there's really opportunities to think about how do we build uh, social justice in our agriculture and food systems? Because um, we really have not done a good job historically. And then this also just provides a way to uh, be an informed voter, as well as I, I, as I heard, you actually wanna maybe take uh, suggestions forward with actually agricultural policy and, and that's awesome. And so with that, I'll stop. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, we are going to have a question and answer and discussion. Um, and I hope people have put some questions in the chat. What I'd like to do just briefly uh, is ask Emily Iverson to tell us her personal story of working on an organic farm. Let's try again. Emily um, is a teacher at, in Chicago at the Noble Charter School, but she's gonna leave teaching and go back to the farm in Norway where she has spent three summers and a Thanksgiving break, which I said, that's, <laughs> that's a long way to go for Thanksgiving, but she obviously adores being there. Emily told me her story and I loved the way it began and how she started out um, feeling about being out in, in the wild. So not that farms are wild, but they're more wild than the city. Um, so Emily, do you wanna unmute yourself and just tell us your experience? Yeah, sure. So first of all, Gary, thank you so much. That was amazing. I took so many notes. <laughs> it was really great. I learned so much. We will have a recording on our YouTube channel too. Oh, good. That's even better because I still missed a lot. <laughs> um, I am certainly not an expert in any way. Um, I really wasn't somebody who got dirty. I didn't like bugs as a kid. Um, I kind of accidentally stumbled across this farming opportunity in 2017, um, fell in love with it. And every teacher break I've had, I've, I've made my way back there. Um, and I'm waiting to get back there this summer. Currently the borders are closed, but um, I use this organization called Woof. It's 
worldwide opportunities in organic farming. And you can choose any country. And essentially it's a platform that matches up a volunteer with a farm um, where you can work 30 hours a week for room and board. Um, so I got so lucky. I ended up at a farm in Northern Norway. Um, it's just outside of the city of Tromsø, which is a, well above the Arctic Circle. Um, and I ended up at Nordval Farm with a farmer named Roger. Um, and so again, he's not a regenerative, his farm is not regenerative, um, it's just organic. Um, but he does have some regenerative practices. So for example, the farm is on a fjord. So at the end of the season, we pick up all the washed up seaweed and bag it. And then over the winter and up until planting season, it rottens. And then when it's time to plant potatoes in the fall or in the spring, sorry, you pull it out of the bag and it's all gooey with all that good stuff growing in there. Um, he does the same thing with the strawberries. So his, his farm is primarily strawberries, potatoes, and carrots. Um, and so at the end of the season, he has all these dead strawberry leaves, bags them, and then uses them as fertilizer the next year. Um, he doesn't have any animals on the farm, but a neighbor has horses and it kind of worked out that to remove horse manure in the way that is legal in Norway, the neighbor would have had to pay a lot of money and to get horse manure, Roger the farmer would have had to pay a lot of money. Um, and so this neighbor actually has found that it is to their benefit to drive their manure over to the farm and dump it so that Roger can use that manure uh, as a fertilizer. Um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it. He, he does some things like he set up his own irrigation system his farm goes up a mountain. And so I wasn't here for this, but he somehow very, you know, kind of jerry-rigged it to make an irrigation system. It's not technological whatsoever. I'm pretty sure he got some tubing and poked some holes and just kind of fed it where it needs to go. Um, and he has little things like he flip-flops um, strawberries and potato fields. I wish I knew the science, I wish I remembered, but they trade off the nutrients in the soil. Um, and the strawberries, he actually leaves, since they're perennials, he leaves the strawberries for about three or four years. Um, and the plants actually come out with a better crop each year. And he has a membrane that covers the rows of the strawberries. And I actually, I don't know if that counts as ground cover as far as the purpose of helping retain water. I don't know, but I'd be curious to know. Um, and he keeps lots of grasses and ground cover in between fields. They don't abut each other. He leaves some space. Um, he also planted rhubarb as a means to block the wind. I think that's it as far as regenerative, regenerative practices. Um, like I said, totally not an expert. I just live this and love it. And if you are curious at all um, into this kind of experience, I highly recommend. There's a Woof USA. I'm a member of it. And there are actually a bunch of specifically regenerative farms um, in Illinois, but also a bunch in Minnesota uh, that you can kind of set up a visit to. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to turn it over now to Don Vicelli, who is the other co-chair of our committee here in the chapter, and he will get, give some questions to Gary, and if anybody has any about Emily's experience, you can ask them as well. Thank you, Cynthia. I want to thank the two speakers. I really enjoyed them. Uh, really, a special thanks to Gary for filling in. We had another speaker who was going to concentrate on RA in Illinois, but you did an excellent job. I put your uh, website, profile website on for people to, to look at, hopefully. Uh, you can also, I don't know if you can see the chat, but there weren't a lot of questions here, but there are so many questions we have in us. First, let me give you a little background. We started this uh, campaign 
um, myself personally because I watched Kiss the Ground. Now, I had no expectations of what was going to happen. I spent 10 years on a farm as a boy, mostly because my dad wanted to be a farmer, not, not because I did. But I know, I understand a little bit how farmers work and think. And uh, I am absolutely convinced with what I'm learning now about RA principles and practices that they can actually save the world. And, and I'm not, and that's no understatement. That may be an understatement because of the car carbon sequester features of a soil based uh, carbon capture is just absolutely amazing. And I put in a little comment they can capture millions of tons, gigatons of carbon, and we might be able to meet the goals that the Paris Climate Agreement has set forth by at least by 2040. Um, I have a few questions. I've added a few questions. Um, uh, my interest, uh, when I when you when I read your uh, what you were going to do for us, I had some questions regarding the USDA. Um, I don't know, for example, how big a role do they play in the agroforestry sector? I know you're interested in it, but are they providing a lot of funding or incentives for farmers to do this? Are you referring to the USDA? Yes. Provide yes. yes. So that's a great question. Actually, um, we have a variety of, of programs. Um, they're not always have the label, you know, broad label of agroforestry, but they do support agroforestry implementation. So you'll hear about the Conservation Reserve Program, EQIP, uh, Conservation Stewardship Program. These are all programs that provide cost share or incentives, contract payments um, for kind of regenerative agricultural practices, agroforestry, perennial cover, things of that nature. <clears throat> um, there's probably always more interest than funds available. Um, and it can vary state by state what a state will offer for their particular farmers. It, it, the funding comes down and then it kind of depends like equip, uh, uh, which is uh, through NRCS, they can determine their uh, state priorities, kind of resource concerns, and then what kind of practices they're going to support for funding. Um, so, but yes, there is uh, some nice uh, federally funded programs through the USDA to support this. One of the reasons I'm asking is we spend billions of dollars to subsidize farmers today to actually not grow anything or to bail them out because of their poor farming practices. And we need a way to transition them out of that into more incentives to do uh, uh, regenerative agriculture methods and because it, it's so beneficial. Um, that that kind of leads into me. My, when I was doing some research, I, I also did not realize how many of the farms, especially in Illinois, are rented. And that has an impact on the types of policies that we want to influence on farm bills on the federal and state level. So that's, that's kind of an interesting, I'm amazed at how, how many farms, they're probably big farms and the resistance is going to be great because if they're commercial, they're still using fertilizers heavily. And um, we see what that's doing. One of your slides for the benefit of the other members, the huge amount of uh, open tilling, ground laid bare through the season, uh, not just the, the possibility of create dust bowls, but what it's doing is it's harming the soil health. And with all the science that we have discovered for creating the microbes, that are beneficial in the soil to reduce um, help in drainage and water uh, retention and to grow plants without tilling. Um, if only more farmers knew that, which is another one of our missions. And, I, and, I, and you mentioned a little bit, now, we're gonna have to educate a lot of people. Um, it's just amazing. Well, the only other question I have before I'll turn it over, maybe there's some other members, um, maybe they, if they're not muted, they could ask their questions. I saw, I saw a couple, um, one, they wanted to wonder if we could get a copy of your PowerPoint presentation. Is that a possibility? You could send that to Cynthia? For sure. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be great because we're going to do our own. And I'm afraid we're going to have to steal some good ones from, I've got a lot of uh, what you mentioned from the EPA and other sources, but um, that's going to be very helpful. I'm glad you brought up the Dust Bowl. I kind of, I'm kind of annoyed that we're back into a situation where there's even the possibility of Dust Bowls after all we went through in the 1930s. 
Um, the last thing I have, I guess, is you mentioned a little bit about the carbon sequestration capabilities of uh, farming. Do you have any idea how much agroforestry contributes to that? I mean, are you doing, is it, does it have to be incorporated in a farming situation or on its own, is it beneficial? In terms of uh, documenting the, the benefits or the quantification of a yeah, carbon both. sequestration? Anything you, your own feeling, if, if nothing else. Yeah, so one of the things we kind of historically are lacking is a good inventory out there to be able to quantify. Um, for instance, the US Forest Service has a uh, forest, uh, forest inventory and assessment program where they go out every year and they basically have sample plots and they measure forest over time and they can get great carbon numbers. The problem with kind of agroforestry elements is that falls outside the definition of forest. These are smaller than uh, forest. But there's efforts underway now with uh, high resolution mapping. We've got an effort uh, going on right now where we've got one meter resolution uh, aerial photography and we're creating tree cover data sets for particularly for the Midwest. Um, so for instance, Nebraska, I believe we found, oh, I'm not gonna actually say the number because I, I might got, I may have got it wrong, but significantly more tree cover than what was documented in the forest cover. So we're, we're building ways um, to start to get, so we can document how much do we have tied up currently out on the landscape. So there are efforts underway on that. There are also efforts, uh, there's a farm tool called Comment Planner and Comment Farm, which allows an entity or a farmer to go in and, and, and not just agroforestry, whatever their, their operation is, describe their practices, uh, put in you know, what they're doing for fertilizer or if they're putting in trees and whatnot, and it'll give them a calculation of the carbon they're sequestering, either offsetting or, or if they're doing some things that aren't. So that's kind of a tool. Uh, it's right now not tied to any market or anything, but you know, there's potential over time going to, to markets um, with that. Um, I, maybe that answers your question. Um, I thank you. Let me ask Cynthia, how much time can I continue with Gary before I ask a question or two of Emily? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. I can't hear you. You're muted, Cynthia, mute. <laughs> Am I out of time, Cynthia? Uh, go to Emily because she has a volleyball game and has to leave soon. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you can, I don't know, if, Gary, if you can look in the chat, there are a couple questions I was gonna ask you from the chat. You can that. ask him one more, but I would go to her first. Yeah, and so let me, I'm gonna, I wanna thank you for what, you, what you've said already. And uh, we'll get back to you on the PowerPoint presentation to get a copy. Um, right. Emily, I was not familiar with the Wolf, is that how you say it, organization? So I went on and looked, looks like there's hosts involved. You gotta be a member somehow. How long do you stay on these farms when you go out there? Um, it really depends on the farm. And so the one that I happened to pick was a minimum of three weeks. And, and there are people, I mean, my dream is to do a whole season. So uh, two of my friends actually just got there yesterday and they're gonna be staying until um, December 1st. What are you so, trying to learn when you do this? Is this part of a program or schooling or something like that? It actually started off as like a means to an end. I wanted to study happiness in Scandinavia, but it's so expensive there. I couldn't afford to have a hotel for a full you know, month. Okay. And so this was supposed to be, oh, you know, I'm not going to like it, but I'll do it. And then I have a place to stay and I can study happiness um, and actually just totally fell in love with it. And so I just, I'm my happiest when I'm there. So there's not really an end game to it. I just like spending as much time there as I can. Can you tell, can you tell our chapter members how uh, big of an organization this is? I actually don't know. Um, it's in countries all around the world and and I know it's really, if you, there's a lot of people using it. If you kind of just throw the term out there, I've found it's pretty well known, but I don't know the size. 
<laughs> okay. I'll talk to your I'll talk to Patty to see how you're doing when you when you get there. <laughs> um, Cynthia, uh, that's all the questions I have. Apparently, the time's out. But if you want to open it up okay, to if, some members, if you, yeah. If we could take one or maybe two more questions for Gary, if anybody has anything. Yeah, Tom, Sutter. Tom Sutter has an interesting one. Tom. Okay. He, he wrote yeah, it. I am. I'm sorry. I just, uh, hi, Gary. No, I want Thanks to read what you both. said, what you want to ask in the chat. See if we can. Yeah. So my question was, some of these uh, techniques and solutions uh, around the uh, areas of uh, regenerative agriculture seem to be game changers. They, I mean, it just seems to be like literally a no-brainer, and yet more people are not doing it than doing it. The no-till, for instance, is what kind of came to mind when you mentioned it. So my question is, why isn't everybody doing this? What, what are the arguments against it? What are farmers saying that is preventing them from implementing some of these solutions? Sure, it's a great, great logical question. And it can vary by kind of practice. So for instance, the no-till, low-till, that does require different implement. Um, it requires a, a drill that can plant in that kind of rough environment that a farmer who wasn't practicing um, no-till or low-till before would have to go purchase. So it, it, there's a cost there. So some of these things do require machinery or uh, process changes. And as you know, any type of change can be difficult, especially if you've done some things generationally. Um, but, uh, you know, and some things will pay off quicker than others economically. Some things take a while to get the payback, uh, but other things will pay off quicker. And so those are kind of some of the, the, the barriers to change. Um, some of it, again, is just culturally, this is the way we did it, you know, and, and you know, always do it. Um, but there are, you know, more and more people are exploring these. It's just, it doesn't happen as quick as we would like. Um, with, uh, I'll, I'll speak a quick on some of the agroforestry pieces in terms of barriers. One, you know, you're talking uh, trees, long lived things. Uh, that's kind of challenging to do when, you know, a person's costing it out. Um, there's also that expertise or knowledge of doing something that has a tree component in it. Um, so that can seem like a barrier. Uh, but we're seeing people who are working out kind of creative agreements. So for instance, there was a sheep producer uh, who wanted trees for shade for her sheep in a system, but she didn't want to grow them, didn't want anything to do with them. She then worked with another producer who says, I don't want anything to do with sheep, but I want to produce chestnuts. And so they worked out an agreement. He put in the chestnuts. He manages that, she manages the sheep, and it's worked out well. Um, that's just an example of how to overcome some of those barriers. But uh, yeah, it's a big topic. It probably could go along more on that, but hopefully that gave you a little snippet. It does. Thanks a lot, Gary. I appreciate it. That answered my question. <laughs> okay, I think we will wind this up. Thank you so much, Gary. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And we'll have a, the recording up on our YouTube channel. And if we have access to your, your slides, um, we can go over this in, in more detail. But you've been a real trooper to expand your, your talk today. And it's been great. So. Thank you, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. A lot of muted applause. <laughs> thank um, you, Gary. And Emily, thank you. You you probably found some people who want to go woofing. <laughs> um, <laughs> On her behalf, uh, as a member of uh, this small ag uh, regenerative agriculture committee, uh, I just would like to pitch about our uh, group. Uh, so we are a new, tiny, but mighty regenerative agriculture committee. And our goals are to advocate and facilitate Illinois farmers to transition to uh, regenerative agriculture practices, uh, researching policies to promote at the state and the federal level, 
and uh, along those lines we are working on drafting bills and other efforts uh, more around uh, advocating and educating uh, different stakeholders uh, we also want to mention that uh, although it has been discussed over chat also that uh, uh, we would highly encourage you all to watch the film kiss the ground uh, which is on the netflix uh, and kiss the ground is a non profit organization and uh, it uh, and that works to uh, towards promoting regenerative agriculture practices at the national and at the state levels uh, in addition to that uh, alana will drop the website in the chat uh, don and alana who are the co chair of this regenerative agriculture uh, group uh, will put their emails in the chat and also the link to a powerpoint uh, about our team which don briefly spoke about and our next meeting is uh, on april 23rd from 5 to 6 pm and it's already on the on the website calendar and we hope some of you will join us uh, and uh, if you want to join us please put in your email in the chat if you want, uh, so that we can uh, reach out to you over email thank you okay thank you so yes we we it's a small uh, committee but we expect to have a lot more people joining particularly we have a possibly 40 people coming in after the training and hopefully some of you will join that committee as well okay now we're going to do breakout rooms and uh i will for 10 minutes and just get to know each other We have a few announcements. I just wanted to mention, and we'll keep talking about this for the next month, but uh, we are going to have our presentation boot camp on May 15th, uh, mainly for all the new members that we get from the training, but certainly other people who haven't been to a boot camp are welcome to come and you will see notices in the calendar in the newsletter um, and many other places social media so the boot camp is kind of a big thing um link you want to say something about Sija? i do um so uh we have uh, an environmental lobby day coming up on uh, April 26th. Uh, I'm going to put in the chat uh, the, the uh, URL to uh, sign up. Um, and also, I put in a bunch of other information uh, about the lobby day. So maybe you want to take a minute and copy it all. Um, Briefly, uh, there's information there uh, about uh, uh, where you can get a teach-in on CJA. Um, there is um, uh, also it's uh, it's this year we're we're uh, cooperate the, our coalition is cooperating with uh, the environmental uh, the Illinois Environmental Council to do. Uh, um, a environmental justice lobby day. So there's two other things we'll be lobbying for. One is um, lead service line replacement uh, bill, and another is environmental uh, justice and permitting, uh, an important bill which um, the people who uh, are fighting against um, uh, General Iron move from Lincoln uh, uh, Park to uh, um, the southeast side, found out that uh, when they, uh, when the state uh, government, uh, I, the state IPA, issued their um, permit for this move, um, that they uh, and people complained about them issuing the permit. They said that they were not allowed to uh, use the past record of environmental violations um, in uh, deciding about the permit. So the environmental justice permitting uh, is going to try to clean up some of that silliness. 
uh, that bill. Uh, so we're going to uh, be um, lobbying for all those three bills. Uh, CJA has been sent to the uh, uh, from uh, out of committee uh, and um, is in a negotiating stage. Uh, so um, getting things moving, uh, hopefully uh, this, uh, this will help. And it's really important, I feel, for people to um, go to this uh, environmental lobby day. It's virtual, you don't have to leave your house um, and um, you'll get a chance to talk to uh, your state senator and your uh, state representative uh, most of those uh, legislators uh, will meet with us. Uh, so I will be uh, leading a team to talk to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Senate district and the two reps representatives uh, uh, in uh, Sarah Feigen Senator Sarah Feigenholz's district. I think probably Jen Jennifer is gonna be uh, leading a team for another um, uh, um, senator's uh, area. And uh, hopefully all of you will get a chance to do this. If you've never been to a lobby day, this is a great way to get started with it. Uh, it really gives you more access uh, to your legislators than uh, when you have to run around Springfield. And I think we have a couple of new people on. I just wanted, you wanna tell them what CJA stands for? It's the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Uh, and it's um, uh, the closest thing to a state level Green New Deal as uh, I think we could get. Uh, and uh, there's, in the chat, there's, uh, I've put a couple ways that you can learn more about it. There's some stuff you can read on the uh, Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition website. And uh, there's a recording of the uh, Illinois Environmental Council uh, teach-in. So, and then there's information about the other two bills. That's all I got. Okay, Jane, you had something about vegans? Yes, not particularly about vegans per se, but I was hoping that we could uh, put together a, because um, we had one of our members approach me about doing some vegan things on the blog and we thought it might be fun to, to develop sort of a vegan support network through the blog. I just need someone to help me put it together. We can start, we can, we can organize getting, you know, recruit people to write about their journeys, write about their either it's the start, if they're at the start of their journey, share recipes. There isn't really much copyright problem with recipe share and it could be a lot of fun and we can maybe develop a whole section of the blog with it. So I'm gonna put my email in the chat. And if you're interested in helping with this, please contact me, the more the merrier. Um, I think that we have a lot of uh, vegans in our group or people who are interested in veganism or doing some, you know, part-time veganism even. Um, so let me know. And I uh, hope to hear from some of you. Thanks. Okay. And Pam, just very quickly, because we're running out of time. Yes. Um, our climate um, moment. Okay. National Climate Reality has introduced a national initiative called Our Climate Moment. And they've done it about the federal uh, bill that is going to be introduced by the Biden administration. Uh, so that we can get major legislation passed that will affect infrastructure generally, but climate specifically. And because it's such an important bill and a one-time opportunity, they are mounting a major national lobbying campaign. We have a federal lobby, a federal advocacy team that is going to be working on this and we would love to have you join us. And the lobbying is going, the uh, advocacy work is gonna be going on between now and probably the end of July. And the expectation is that this bill will get passed sometime around August or September. So it's a, it's a concentrated amount of time. We would love to have you join the team. 
uh, and anyone that even can't join the team but is willing to chime in and talk to your legislators, uh, please put your email in the chat and we will be in touch with you. Before people go, Cynthia, Hello. yeah, we're gonna get a picture. <laughs> Thank you for I've, remembering. I've warned everybody and they're all waiting. They're <laughs> ready to smile and <laughs> jam it out. So, um, it was, was there anything else? Should we do that now? Can we do that yeah. now? Uh, yeah. No, that's fine. Do that now, except I'd like to say that I kept saying I was putting this in the chat, but I hadn't hit enter. So <laughs> I just put it in the chat. So if you that's want a it, long one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, grab it now if you can't, if, if you didn't, if you were looking for it and couldn't get it, especially the top line with the uh, lobby day sign up. And just so everybody knows, if you click on those three dots in the bottom right corner, you can download the chat to your computer. There's lots of great information in there. Highly encourage you guys to do that. Um, so we do have two screens worth of people. So um, I, I encourage you to wave or whatever, but I, I got the first screen that's gonna go first. So everybody give us a big grin, say hello. That's one screen, just a second. We're going for another one. Thanks for coming, everybody. Great to see all the smiling faces. Okay, got it. Hopefully no blinkers. <laughs> okay, so thank you all. Uh, great to see you all. And our next general meeting will be on May 20th. So put it on your calendar and we'll keep you posted as we de develop our plans. We we do expect to have Emily Heaton back, not back because she wasn't here, but it rescheduled for another time. She felt very bad that she couldn't talk to you and she can go into more about Illinois and the agriculture. So good night, everyone. Good night, thank good you. Good to see everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.